Well, a good afternoon and a very warm welcome. My name is the Reverend Jonathan Kaur. I'm the Minor Canon and Six Centre at St Paul's. It's good to have you with us and very good to introduce Mark Barrett, who is a Benedictine monk at Worth Abbey. His book, Crossing, Reclaiming the Landscape of Our Lives, has been called a spiritual classic and an unusually fresh insight into the life of a contemporary monk, very different from the shadowy medieval figure of media gothic, as he puts it, but just fellow seekers like us and apprentices in the spiritual workshop. Since he wrote the book more than 10 years ago, the monks of Worth Abbey got a lot less shadowy and medieval when the television series The Monastery became a surprise TV hit. Not actually on the level of Strictly Monastery, <laughs> but with three million viewers and a sudden dramatic increase in people wanting to come to Worth on retreat, what they saw, I believe, was an authentic glimpse of the rewarding, difficult, real life of spiritual seeking. And that is also what Mark's book gives us, and which we're going to hear from him about today. Father Mark will talk for about 40 minutes or so, then we'll have some time for your questions, and hopefully for his answers, and to buy his book as well, if you would like to do so. So now, it is my pleasure to welcome Father Mark Barrett. Thank you. Thank you, John, Jonathan, thank you for that very kind introduction, and uh, it's a great pleasure to see all of you here today and to be invited to speak about the experience of writing crossing, the experience of responding to how readers of that book um, encountered what I've written, and I'll go on at the end, if time allows, to say a little bit about the experience of filming the monastery. I'm not quite sure which part of um, that particular tour uh, you have arrived hoping to visit, perhaps all of it, or perhaps some of it, but let's see where we get to. One of my favorite writers, the fantasy author Neil Gaiman, speaks of what he calls the fraud police who afflict writers and artists. What he means by that is that as soon as one creates something, one becomes convinced that it can't possibly be any good. Uh, in his case, he says he fears that one day they will come and knock at the door and they will have come to tell him that he's got to stop doing what he enjoys doing and get a real job. Whenever I'm asked to speak about my own work, uh, I have my own version of the fraud police and they and I had a long interview last night. Anyway, I survived and so here I am. I'd like to say a little about how crossing, reclaiming the landscape of our lives, came into being because I didn't set out with the aim of being a writer and I certainly did not set out with the aim of writing what apparently has been called a spiritual classic. What happened was this. In the Latter, the latter years of the last millennium, gosh, that makes it sound a long time ago, doesn't it? A great friend of mine, Sister Gemma Simmons, a name and possibly a face known to some of you, and almost certainly a voice who will have been heard by most of you, she does a lot of radio work. My old friend, Sister Gemma Simmons, wrote a piece in the Catholic newspaper, The Tablet, Gemma's work involves many, many different dimensions, but one of them is as a spiritual director and a leader of retreats. And the piece she wrote for the tablet was a reflection upon her experience of leading retreats for parish groups particularly, and these would be parish groups in the Catholic Church for the most part, because I suspect I hope that the criticism which she offered in her piece would not apply to Anglican priests because the focus of her attention was not the parishioners who she said entered beautifully and fruitfully into the experience of going on retreat but what she had to say was this that it's often very difficult for priests, for clergy, 
to work alongside their parishioners as fellow seekers, as vulnerable and not <coughs> as figures who have all the answers, spiritual gurus, if you like. What she was saying was, could the clergy climb occasionally off their pedestal and be prepared to allow everyone to see that, like other Christians, they struggle, they have doubts, they find things difficult. I've known Gemma for many years, and she's never one not to come forward when there is something to come forward and say that needs saying. And I thought that what she said was wise and timely. And it reminded me that as someone in this um, sort of monastic Gothic suit, it's only too easy to hide behind the identity. It's only too easy not to allow one's fundamental humanity, one's vulnerability, one's difficulties and one's doubts to be seen by people. And let me say at once that there are times when it's wholly inappropriate to do that. But there are moments, and perhaps retreats and perhaps spiritual direction are a good example of moments when it is appropriate, there are moments when it's appropriate for the priest to be a fellow seeker alongside the people. Because after all, first and foremost, all of us are the baptized. All of us are following the way of Jesus Christ, and priests are not any more special as followers than anybody else. So that was Gemma's challenge. And I thought that was very well worth responding to, so I wrote a letter to the editor of the tablet, John Wilkins, in which I attempted to respond and to say a little about my own encounter with my vulnerability and why perhaps it is difficult for ministers to allow others to see their struggles. John is a remarkable and wonderful man and was a great editor of the tablet. And he had the generosity to write back to me and tell me that what I'd written him wasn't a letter. It was an article. And he was also kind enough to tell me how to reshape it in such a way that he could publish it, which he promptly did. That article was the germ of crossing. And it provoked quite a, a, a lot of personal correspondence to me, of which one letter came from Brendan Walsh, at that time the editorial director of Darton, Longman and Todd. Brendan had an offer that I could not refuse. Now, I had always supposed that books appeared as a result of solitary authors slogging away in garrets and then sending their precious manuscript to publishers who promptly rejected it and having to uh, slog around from publisher to publisher to publisher until they found someone who would take them under their wing. And hence, I was never prepared to do the hard work of writing a book because I thought, after all that work, why would I want to go through the process of trying to get it published? Brendan's offer, as I said, one that could not be refused, was, please write me a book and we'll publish it. So I thought, well, that's not going to happen every day of the week. At that time, not only was I a monk of worth, which I was and I remain, but as a monk of worth, I was a teacher and a school housemaster, which means that I was reasonably busy. But I thought, this offer isn't going to come around again. It's not every day a publisher knocks on your door and says, please write me a book. So I used every available spare moment to get to work on producing uh, the book, which I've been asked to come and talk to you here about today. So the book emerged from the question, how can ordinary Christians understand the spiritual journey, the struggles, the joys and the sorrows of Christians who look as though they know what they're doing? <laughs> or at least their clothes suggest that someone thinks they know what they're doing. I wanted to write a book which authentically represented three things, I suppose. One would be 
some of the reality of monastic living. One would be some of the dimensions of my own encounter with God, or failure to be encountered by God. And the third would be a wider consideration of what is there in the Christian theological and cultural tradition that throws light upon those other two themes. Now that sounds great as a recipe, but the problem I then found was how do you give that a shape? How on earth do you make that turn into a book? And it dawned upon me that the answer was right in front of my nose. I mentioned a moment ago that I, I was working as a teacher in the school that we run at Worth Abbey, Worth School, and my primary area of teaching is the subject which I've been studying all my life, the literature of this land, English literature. And as a teacher of English literature and writing, the first piece of advice as an adult teacher that one always gives to children is write about what you know, don't write about what you don't know. Now children always ignore that, which is wonderful, which is why they come up with the most fantastically fabulous narratives. Um, Adults, for the most part, are better advised to take that advice. <laughs> it can be disastrous if you try to write about something that you're completely ignorant of. And so I thought, well, what is the thing that I do know most about as a monk? Well, the thing I found I knew most about was the fact that monks are renowned for going to church and singing psalms at all sorts of times of the day and night. And I thought, I will take the shape of the monastic day as defined by the divine office, the celebration of the work of God together in choir in church, singing psalms, listening to readings, praying together. I'll take that shape and I'm going to use that as a series of hooks to try to hang my reflections upon. And so, if you know the book Crossing, you'll know that it's divided into chapters, each of which arises from one of the offices, one of the prayer services of the monastic day, beginning in the early morning with the office of vigils or matins, then the dawn office, morning prayer or lords, working through to the midday prayer, which falls, surprisingly enough, in the middle of the day, and then tumbling across into the afternoon to vespers or evening prayer as the sun begins to set, and then night prayer as bedtime beckons. And I thought that actually, as I reflect upon it, gives me a, a, a theme which I hadn't really intended to think about, but which, as it were, found its own way into the book, which is that the shape of the day and the way we often conceptualize the shape of our lives has something in common. So the day which begins with so much bright promise and then leads us into long and we hope fruitful labors which we might begin to be able to harvest towards the end of our working lives then leading towards a period of reflective retirement, perhaps, that shape of the day and the shape of our lives can be used as a way of allowing the one to reflect upon the other. So I found that my idea of a biographical element, a monastic element, and then a theological spiritual element had potential at any rate. Now at that point, I uh, was introduced by a friend of mine to creations of um, Douglas Adams, the writer of the, um, the restaurant at the end of the universe, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and many other wonderfully funny science fiction novels. It was Douglas Adams who apparently invented the holy lunching friars of Voldoon, <laughs> who had observed that the shape of man's spiritual day paralleled the shape of man's life. <laughs> 
and had made this the foundation of their spirituality. That and having lunch in very good restaurants, apparently. Um, and so, although I thought I'd come up with an original and brilliant idea, I discovered Douglas Adams and no doubt many, many others got there first. Even so, it's a fruitful, um, I found it a fruitful idea to explore. And it was with that idea um, that I set about creating the shape of crossing. One or two commentators who, who read the book and then reviewed it afterwards seemed to be under the impression that it was a work of uh, erudite study about the divine office, that it was in some sense a history or a theology of the divine office. It isn't, and it was never supposed to be, and, and I don't think they actually read my book. I think they must have um, read a different book. Um, it, it really only uses the divine office as hooks to explore ideas. I do, of course, along the way, talk about the experience of praying the divine office, but at no point was it my intention to explore the history of monastic prayer, to explore the history of Catholic liturgy, or um, even to claim any expertise in those areas for the simple reason that I don't have any. Let me turn then to say what I, what I did try to explore in the different chapters of Crossing. They've each got their own titles, and um, I did have a sort of provisional plan in mind for the shape that each chapter should take, but as is often the case, especially if you write a story, um, the characters take on a life of their own and go off somewhere completely different from where you were anticipating that they might take you. And the same happened with the ideas behind the chapters in Crossing. Nevertheless, there was a general shape in mind. When I wrote this book, I was a little younger than I am now, and while I wouldn't say that I now spring out of bed every single morning joyfully and uh, as bright as a lark, I've become a bit more of a morning person than I was when I wrote Crossing. Because the first idea I wanted to explore was the fact that I find getting out of bed, or I did at that time, I found getting out of bed probably the most painful experience of the day. I just didn't want to do it. Um, I, think, I think my adolescence lasted for about 50 years. Um, and it was that experience of reluctance it's very difficult, actually, to do certain things. That idea of reluctance was what I wanted to explore in the first chapter. So, although it's nominally a chapter about the vigil service at the beginning of the monastic day, it's really a chapter about how very curious it is that we commit ourselves to high ideals or, or even just simple practical projects and then lose our nerve, as it were. Just feel we can't do this. It's, it's more than I've, I've bitten off more than I can chew. I, I, I didn't realize it was going to be so difficult. Um, or as, as a, a great teacher of mine, the, the Jesuit theologian uh, John O'Donnell um, famously put it, quoting uh, from T.S. Eliot, there's an element in us that just does not want to turn again, does not want to face the realities of the Christian struggle. And uh, John focused his reflection on this theme, particularly in the season of Lent. Uh, and he beautifully wrote about the idea that um, each Lent comes around as a sort of a surprise. We know it's coming, but each time it comes, it surprises us because there is a very strong element, in, in me anyway, and I suspect it's there in you as well, that really doesn't want to have to re-engage with the difficult task of facing failure, facing um, struggle, facing the, the hard tasks which we know we're not good at. And so I wanted to begin with a chapter that handled those difficult issues and recognized that the encounter with God can be wonderful, but it can also be threatening. It can be upsetting. It can take us to places we're not sure we wanted to go. And so my theme of exploring vulnerability and difficulty 
emerged at the very beginning of the book as the very first reality and as a very mundane reality. It can be hard to get out of bed in the morning. Well, I think that's about as common a human experience as one could go for, and it's certainly true of monks. You may be surprised to know, if you've never read The Rule of Saint Benedict, that that author, writing in the sixth century, recognized that problem, and he encourages an abbey to set out its dormitory in such a way that younger brethren have their beds distributed among those of older brethren. Why does he do that? I think he does that because he wants those who've got better at the business of getting out of bed in the morning to be spread out to help those who are less good at it. And he explicitly asks that those who are able to do that easily encourage and support those who can't do it. And St. Benedict's point, which would also be mine, is that, of course, the encouragement and support, which we're all asked to give to one another, isn't only about getting out of bed in the morning. That's just where it begins. So reluctance and the encounter with reluctance was my starting point. My second chapter on morning prayer was about the more energized side of beginning, how beginnings can themselves be most wonderful um, gate openers. It's my experience, and I suspect you may share it as well, that if you can bring yourself to begin, whatever the task is, you then discover a new energy which you didn't know was going to be there. You encounter other people who are trying to do the same thing. You find examples of those who've achieved this thing before, and you enter into dialogue with them. The very fact that one has committed to something is a source of energy, a source of grace, and a source of insight. And I used a number of images from my own life experience to explore that idea. I was particularly fascinated by the fact that my own religious history is a history of beginnings. I was not brought up as a, a Christian or a Catholic. And so my encounter with faith was an unusual one. I won't bore you with all the details, but there came a moment when I knew that I had to go and find a Catholic priest, and I had to find out what was this Catholic thing about. Now, of course, if one was to wander into a great church like St. Paul's Cathedral, finding a priest, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Father Jonathan, would probably be quite straightforward. But I had the image that my local Catholic church in the town of Huddersfield, where I grew up, um, would be kind of crawling with clergy, and all I had to do was open the door and go in, and someone would say, Alleluia, or whatever it is they say under those circumstances, uh, and all the problems would be solved. Anyway, I found a Catholic church after much struggle, um, and it was bereft of clergy. They were not um, there in their throngs. So I, I went and knocked on the door of the house next door, which I took to be possibly a clergy house. And the, the door was opened, and, were, and I was welcomed by a friendly Irish dragon who said, What do you want? <laughs> she turned out to be the priest's housekeeper and a wonderful person. But she conceived it as her job to protect father from marauding parishioners, which she assumed me to be in the first instance. She was completely disarmed, I discovered later, by my question, by my answer rather to her question, what do you want? Because my answer was, I want to be a Christian. Apparently no one had ever said that to her before. <laughs> ah, she said, it'll be Monsignor O'Brien you'll be wanting then. And she was right. <laughs> and six months later, after a remarkable, remarkable series of weekly meetings with a, a delightful, very holy and very learned Catholic priest, I was received into the Catholic Church. And um, I would say I've never looked back, but I've never regretted making that move. But my point is that that change, that beginning, 
opened up doors, in that case quite literally, um, which I would not have otherwise encountered. So my second chapter, Beginnings, is about how doors open in front of us and how if we can accept the challenges that are presented to us, we sometimes will discover that we're not the only people facing those issues and we can in fact support and help one another along the way. In the central chapter of the book, I turned to experiences which were, at that time for me, still very raw and fresh. I was in my, what am I now, I'm in my late 50s now, so I suppose I was in my middle 40s uh, when I wrote Crossing. And I'd got to that stage in my own life, uh, and I think this is again a common experience. Uh, this chapter, incidentally, was the chapter I received most correspondence about from readers of the book. Um, the midway chapter, I think we all reach points in our lives where we ask ourselves, or the question is asked of us really, it's not a, a, a thing one does voluntarily, it, it just sort of happens. One is put in a place of asking, why on earth am I doing what I'm doing? Is there any value in what I'm doing? I've chosen the wrong route. Those people over there appear to be doing something much more fruitful. Those people over there appear to be enjoying themselves much more. Those people over there seem to be uh, living in a way that, that I thought I was going to be living, but I'm not living in that way. So my central chapter was about what I called the noonday demon of a sort of boredom, a sort of acidy, a sort of ennui, in which the foundations of one's own way of being seem to fall out from under one. And I became fascinated by how many great works of literature, and, uh, and I used particularly Dante uh, in that chapter, how many great works of literature seem to begin with that experience. You'll be aware, obviously, that, that Dante begins the Commedia at that moment in his middle years when he suddenly had the experience of finding himself lost. And he tells it as a story in which the lostness is a literal lostness. And he has to walk uh, step by step down into the very depths of the inferno itself before he can find his way back to real life. Um, and while I wouldn't characterize my experience of those middle years as anything like that dramatic, it nevertheless had that quality of entering a labyrinth, entering a period when I really didn't know why I was doing what I was doing. I was blessed to discover not only among my own brethren, but among good friends from outside the monastic life, many people who were able to help me walk that path. But I think it's a path that each of us finds herself or himself walking at some point in our lives. One rather superficial review of Crossing um, somewhat tritely assumed that I was writing a chapter about a coded sexual problem, or rather a coded chapter about a sexual problem. Um, there was a sexual dimension to the crisis. I think we all live post-Freud, and therefore it would be very naive to say that there wasn't. But that's not really the point. The point is, one's entire raison d'etre can just sort of go next door. Um, and at that point, you have to be able to find out once again, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why is this worth doing? Or indeed, is this worth doing? It could have been the case that I was on the wrong road and maybe in some ways I was. But that chapter is about encountering one's own lostness. And I notice as I, as I speak uh, today that the chapters alternate really between um, difficult themes and encouraging themes. And so the, the chapter that followed, the Vespers or Evening Prayer chapter, which is really about gathering in or harvest is a chapter which invites us to encounter some more positive themes. 
If we've come through all those earlier challenges of actually getting started, overcoming reluctance and doubt and difficulty, if we've encountered the challenge of just losing our way completely and we're still going, then perhaps we get to the point where we're able to celebrate our own kind of harvest festival, the harvest of our lives. And while there may be stages of life at which this particularly happens, I think it happens at all stages of life to some extent or other. Certainly that's true if one takes the trouble to reflect, to stand back. Perhaps it's about the experience of retreat. Perhaps it's about the experience of journaling for some people. Or simply writing and seeking to use self-expression as a way of shaping my experience, of giving it um, a pattern, of discovering what has been happening in my life while I've been so busy with my family or my job or my parish or whatever has been at the forefront of my life. There come moments, and there, come, there comes particularly a moment, it seems to me, as we reach the end of our working lives, where we need to allow that richness to come home to us in order that it can nourish us again and in order that we can be able to nourish others from that largesse. My final chapter, the Compline chapter, um, was a bit of an exercise of imagination because at the age of 40-something when I wrote Crossing, I didn't really believe I was ever going to die. Um, I remember my mother telling me, uh, and she is happily still alive, but I remember her telling me, oh, you're far too young ever to believe that you're going to die. You have to get to a certain age before that happens. And, and I thought, yeah, 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 mothers, they say those sorts of things, don't they? Uh, but I, I've got to say, I think she's right. I think, I think there has, you, you, have to have a, you have to be carrying a certain number of years before the reality of mortality actually comes home to one. Um, I mean, notionally, of course, it's always there, but it happens to other people, doesn't it? The fact that one has got an allotted time and then one will be asked to let go of everything that has been precious and that continues to be precious is itself immensely challenging and potentially very threatening. I had a, a dress rehearsal for this um, about 10 years ago now, which wasn't a medical thing, it wasn't a health thing, it was a career change because having been a professional monk schoolmaster for all of my monastic life, um, I was asked to change direction and to return to academic studies in London University, which is a terrific thing um, and a very positive and life-giving thing. However, the experience of shifting my career path, my place of living, and the work I was doing, all at the same time, in retrospect, was probably rather unwise. I remember moving from rural Sussex to the West End of London to begin work on a doctorate. And after a few weeks, beginning to think, well, it wasn't a thought, actually. It was a, a lyric from a Beatles song began to go through my head. There's an old Beatles song uh, in which the lyric goes, she said, I know what it's like to be dead. And I have no idea why that lyric came into my head. I wasn't even conscious of ever having heard the song. But it perfectly expressed what I was feeling. I felt as if I'd become invisible, as if I'd become almost a ghost, as if I was dead. I used to have, when I was working as a housemaster and a school leader and a teacher, endless people wanting to see me all the time about all sorts of things. People writing me lots and lots of letters, people sending me emails. The telephone messages would just stack up. And I thought it was me they wanted to talk to. <laughs> How naive is that? Um, 
And I moved away from those responsibilities and I assumed that there would still be queues of people outside the door waiting to see me and that um, I would be trying to find time to do this, that and the other between the vitally important meetings that would be going on and nobody came and the phone didn't ring. <laughs> and I knew what it was like to be dead. And I had to start again. I can remember, this, this may, may I hope make you laugh, it made me laugh when it happened to me. It suddenly dawned upon me that the reason I was sitting alone in my room every evening was that it had not occurred to me that what human beings do is they make arrangements to meet people <laughs> and have a social life. I'd never actually had time to do that. <laughs> and so when the, when the life stopped appearing on a conveyor belt, I, I sat there kind of dumbstruck for a few weeks. And then eventually it occurred to me, oh, now I see what I have to do. And gradually from the floor up, I rebuilt a version of my life. And of course, I discovered that there were still people who wanted to see me and wanted to see me. I should say, rather than had an issue that they wished uh, for me to address. But in a small way, and it, it was only a small way, um, I had a little bit of an insight into what it means to let go of things, or as that chapter puts it, to walk away. So I had the experience of walking away. So each of those chapters explored something that is real in my lived experience, something which connected to an aspect of monastic living, <laughs> at least tangentially in some cases, um, and in the book I tried to explore the theological and the spiritual and sometimes the literary and, and filmic um, images which might be helpful in illuminating those topics. To my surprise, when the book was published, it, it was well received. I, I hadn't tried to do this kind of thing before, and therefore I didn't quite know how it would go. My favourite my favorite review of Crossing uh, was published in the Brighton Evening Argus <laughs> by a, 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 a reporter who did a two-page spread with a large photograph, very generous space, under the headline, The Monk Who Can't Get Enough of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> and thereby hangs a tale. Um, but I did learn from that experience that when a reporter says a lot of things and you nod, you've got to be very careful because <laughs> every single one of those things that I nodded at turned up as a direct quotation from me. <laughs> um, so, uh, I do quite enjoy Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but not that much. <laughs> um, the book was well received and, and stayed around for quite a while. I think it's now out of print, but we've managed to, to dig out a few um, archive copies, which are, are doubly valuable. I've probably signed each of them twice already, but I'll do it again if, you, if anyone's interested. Um, let me conclude then by just turning very briefly to the experience of filming the monastery, um, a kind of reality TV show in which we reinvented the reality TV show as a religious program. It's curious how that came about. The BBC wanted to follow a set of new recruits joining a monastic community, a little bit like the way they've done with uh, recruits joining a profession or going into the army or something. Um, they went, we think, to every single religious house in England, and if I tell you, remind you anyway, that my monastery is called Worth Abbey, that begins with W, you can see that they were getting a bit desperate by the time they got that far down the alphabet. Our then abbot, Christopher Jamison, explained to them that nobody was ever going to let them make the programme they want to make. It would be massively intrusive and completely wrong. And apart from anything else, there weren't enough people joining religious <laughs> houses for them to do it, but we didn't tell them that. Um, he said, though, and he was the only person in the country to try this manoeuvre, 
No one will ever let you make the program you want to make, but let me pitch back at you the program you should have gone out to try and make. And he invented for them the idea of the show in which five specially recruited participants stayed for, I think it was about a month. The BBC always insists on calling it 40 days and 40 nights because it's <laughs> vaguely biblical. Um, but it was basically about a month. And that television vehicle has got, to my mind, a lot in common with Crossing. Um, it reached a much wider audience, that's not really my point. My point is really that in both cases, what I think we were trying to do was to allow the context of monastic living to be a vehicle for those who don't live in monasteries and have no need to or wish to, to allow the context of monastic living for those people to become a mode of self-exploration and to enrich their spiritual lives. We saw it, we saw the TV show, and I see the book, as a way of bringing something of what is available in the monastery to those who don't live in monasteries. And my impression from uh, the fact the monastery is still out there on YouTube and um, Crossing is still out there being sold secondhand on Amazon, um, <laughs> that there is a demand for that kind of thing. The, the follow-up shows to the monastery suggest similarly that there is an appetite for, you, for making use of the riches of the tradition of monastic living to explore your own spirituality in other contexts. An older model of Catholic spirituality, anyway, tended towards the view that everyone should try and live as close to the life of a monk as possible, and if they did so, that was a way of becoming holy. I think a better take on that tradition, which is what the monastery is about, and is what crossing is about, is that in the monastic tradition are a range of resources which can be employed in one fashion, within monastic living itself, but are available in other forms to be used in other more secular or parish contexts. So that, in a, in a nutshell, is what I think those two events, the book and the TV show, have in common. Let me finish by saying that I think at the heart of both also is a desire to what I call acknowledge ambivalence. There is sometimes a tendency to suppose, at least outside the Catholic Church, um, and perhaps outside the churches, that people inside the churches know the answers. And what it seems to me is so crucial is that if we are to speak effectively to one another and to speak effectively to our society, we must indeed know what we believe, but we must also acknowledge the ambivalence which is present in us and the ambivalence which we experience as we try to live out our beliefs. Thank you very much for coming along to listen, and if you have questions, I shall be happy to try to answer them. Thank you. Well, as Father Mark says, if you, if you have questions, now is the time. Um, obviously, we, he has mentioned that he doesn't always have the answers, but hopefully there will be some about his own book, at least. Gentlemen there. Ah, the easy ones first. <laughs> um, let, let me start by answering a, a slightly different question, because I'm fascinated by your, observance of, uh, by your observation about the bold decision regretted the next morning. Um, sorry, I'm just going to sniffle. Some of the worst mistakes I've ever made happened late at night. 
We won't go into those, but let me, let me, give, you <laughs> let me give you a couple of examples that, that I don't mind having on YouTube. Um, one, one, of the, one of the most uh, wonderful contemporary inventions and one of the most terrible is email and instant communication. I now have a rule for myself that if I write an email after nine o'clock at night, I don't send it. <laughs> and I review it in the morning, and then I usually delete it. Um, now, I don't know how closely that comes to answering your real question, but I suppose the difference that I observe in myself now is a willingness to pause for thought. Uh, that's not inherently the same thing as, as being a morning person. You can pause for thought and be an evening person. Um, but I think the, the biggest change that I notice happening at the same time, it's not really a growth in wisdom, it's probably a growth in prudence. The two are related, they're not the same thing. Uh, but I, but I do strongly believe that uh, it can be most imprudent to act on first thought, first um, desire, first enthusiasm. Now that may sound as though I'm, I'm undermining my own principle of the, of the dynamism of beginnings, but I'm not. Um, I think one can still begin very dynamically having paused to ask oneself, just how wise is it to do this thing that I'm about to do? It just sounds like a, a bigger opportunity for reductance. That's very probably true. <laughs> I, I wouldn't claim for a moment that, that I have given up reluctance or abandoned it. I, I think I began by talking about the fraud police. Um, when I agree, whenever I agree to come and, and speak to a group, I was uh, recently asked to go, and, to go and speak for two days to parish groups in the, the Diocese of Lincoln in Grimsby and had a, a marvellous time doing that. But as soon as I'd agreed, I regretted that I'd agreed. And I regretted it for the intervening two months until I actually got there to do it and regretted it profoundly on the way there. Um, I think that I've discovered that there are, in me, certain reactions that I know are going to happen. And some of them are now old friends. They're very uncomfortable old friends, and I'd rather not have to keep on meeting them, but I think I am going to keep on meeting them. But because I know I'm going to keep on meeting them, I can be ready for them and they don't catch me out in quite the same way. Sometimes they do, but, but they don't always catch me out in quite the same way. Uh, a, a great friend of mine, one of the greatest teachers and best teachers I've ever known, um, who taught alongside me in, in the school where I taught, revealed to me once that she became utterly terrified before every new school term began. And I said, I'm so pleased to hear someone say that because that happens to me and I thought it was just me. Um, completely de-skilled, completely convinced she has no capacity to do this or interest in it or ability to handle children or any of the things that in fact she's completely brilliant at. And the moment the process starts, it's fine, she's okay. So I think there, there are um, a series of old friends, if you like, or you might call them demons, um, who haunt each of us. And part of the art of, of living well, I've become convinced, is to become aware of who they are. And just as in the old art of demonology, when you can name the demon, you can control it. If you know that giving a talk is going to terrify you for three days before you do it, well, one's still terrified for three days before one does it, but you know that's going to happen, you can to some extent contain it. Um, so, is it, is it a way of becoming reluctant on a different level? Well, it probably is. <laughs>
where, where, would, where would we be without spontaneity as far as humour is concerned? Humour is often a matter of timing, isn't it? And, and to be able to make that, that witty, quick response, which has made us all laugh at some point when someone we know who, who is genuinely witty says something spontaneous and quick, that's very life-giving and very joyful. Surprise parties, how marvellous they wouldn't be uh, as marvellous if they weren't surprises, if they didn't have that element of spontaneity about them. So clearly, spontaneity is an, uh, an equal and opposite element to those elements of prudence and consideration that I've been um, speaking about. I suppose the issue is knowing when it is appropriate and necessary to move with, with proper prudence and proper forethought, and when something is an area where spontaneity, the thought of the moment, the, the instant response is appropriate. And perhaps what, what the gentleman was referring to earlier might be uh, where things have gone wrong, when, when big decisions have been made and then regretted. Perhaps the, the, the issue is whether the issue about which we are choosing to behave in a spontaneous or a considered manner is one of great weight or one where there's more to play with, if you like. Thank you. That's, um, gosh, there's a lot there. Um, a, a flippant first thought. You mentioned my being a writer. Uh, I was invited by the publisher to a party for writers, and I said, well, I can't really be there. I'm not a writer. And they said, well, you, you published a book. That's what writers do. <laughs> and so I said, well, no, I suppose I am. <laughs> uh, so my, my fraud police are, are fairly active, even in circumstances like that. Where was I before I was a Christian? And, and does that relate to the question that you're asking? I, I, I'm not sure, but let me, let me just try something out. Um, I wasn't quite sure whether to put this into the talk, so I didn't, but it, but it kind of emerges from your question. Where was I before I was a Christian? I was massively preoccupied with the occult. Um, in, in a totally amateur way, as Dennis Wheatley used to say at the front of all these books. Um, and I can remember saying as a teenager, as I, what, they said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm going to be a wizard, I said. And this is before Harry Potter. So um, I think that the great preoccupation of much of our contemporary society is what I'd call Gnosticism. Not so much a preoccupation with a... Uh, either an idealized or an overly reified past, which is what I think you're, you're pointing us towards, a preoccupation with um, powerful knowledge. And that's really what I think my teenage self was preoccupied by. And that's really why I was fascinated by um, images of the occult. And what I think Christianity does is it challenges us to go somewhere quite different. Because Christianity, while it does use the categories of power, and we'd be naive if we said it didn't, is essentially about powerlessness. It's about being vulnerable, and it's actually about God's vulnerability. So what I see the Christian present as offering is a connection to the past, and in that sense, I think we are um, occupied with the past, if not preoccupied with it, but occupied with it. But I see us as not attempting, as it were, an inappropriate archaeology of religion, which is possibly what concerns you, but rather um, an engagement with a, a tradition of life, a way of living which has actually been passed from generation to generation. And I think that's a very different way of engaging with the past, a very different way of discovering how the past can allow us to be vulnerable in the present. Um, and a, a pilgrimage away from the categories of 
powerful knowledge of secret systems of control um, into categories which are public, which are open, which are available to all. Um, so sorry, a rather complex, a potentially rather complex <laughs> answer to what, to what was quite a complex question. In a way, what you're asking is, is a version of the classic problem of evil question. How, how can things go wrong if God is good? And, and you've asked it actually in a way which um, points towards an answer that, that often seems to me to be one that we avoid. And that is that an awful lot of the things that go wrong between people and within society are the result of the way that we choose to behave and the structures which we choose to establish. Um, I, I, I don't wish to be um, involved in, in holding forth on the National Health Service because I, I just don't know enough about it. Uh, there are many others who do know something about it. But what, what I, I think what I'd say as a theological response to your question is that there are situations where events befall people and it can seem as though those are somehow coming directly from the hand of God. And then I think the theologian has a, an issue on her hands or, or his hands. But there are other situations where it seems very apparent that human causality is the prime agent um, in the situation. And there, I think, <coughs> While the theologian might offer insights, it's really for all of us to work together as a society to figure out how does the society in question address those problems which it has manufactured for itself. And so I'm, uh, I'm sorry that you're having that or have had that struggle, but I, I do feel that sometimes some of those problems are of our own. I don't mean your personal manufacturer, I mean our manufacture, it's the way we've set things up. Well, I'd very much like to thank you, uh, Father Mark, for your warmth, for the modesty, the humour and wisdom that has come out, not just from your book, but from what you've said to us today and for your answers to our questions. So I'm, I'm sure we'd all like to show our appreciation for you. Um, indeed. There are copies of Father Mark's book available, and he's very happy to sign them for you as well. Um, there are lots of interesting things coming up as, as a result of our um, events here at St. Paul's. Uh, the final session in the series of How to Change the World on the 19th of November is with Rowan Williams and Michael Battle, talking about how we can achieve peace, I believe, is the... the how we, can, how, we the how we can just change the world together. That's even bigger than the, the, the thought of peace as well. And next month's Sunday Forum on the 1st of December is with Janet Morley on her book Haphazard by Starlight, an Advent Pilgrimage. So please do keep looking at our website. There's some information and leaflets on the front desk here for, for you to collect on the, on the way out if you want to browse those. And I'm very pleased that you could join us today and thank you for doing so. Thank you.